All right, so people can come and go. I might just get started. People have told me you can see your my screen. That's great. Thanks everyone for joining um, in whatever time zone you're in. It's the first time for me giving a lecture at 8 p.m. on a Saturday night, um, especially one where I can't see who I'm talking to. So you'll have to help me out by being extra friendly on the other side um, of your screen. So I'm sitting here in my cold uh, bedroom. Um, mm. And I'll try and be entertaining, right? Because tutorials are meant to be fun and engaging. And yeah, me speaking to myself in a room is not so conducive to that. So we'll have to do our best um, as a collective. So this is it, let's go full screen. Um, screen means the participants is now hard to see. Let's try and move all this out to the edge of my screen. I have some ideas about, okay. Maybe I just get rid of participants altogether then. That's gonna block my, all right, let's go. All right, so I can see myself. Okay, this should be fine. Um, okay, so we're online. I've, like I said, I've never done this sort of thing before, maybe you too. Um, and I had the suggestion that I'm not sure if I'm still in the same mood, but that we take regular breaks as if we're Saturday night in a nightclub, right? And those of you in Berlin, it would be just as reasonable for you to be there at midday uh, on a Saturday. So I thought just to break up the mood, we might, I might play a little break as a song uh, every 30, 40 minutes. And if you want to suggest songs to play, you can put them in the chat or in the um, Neurostars. So that will help maybe break up the three hours. So it's not just one big block and that will help all of us, I think. Um, so there's some ways I want to run the tutorial in the gray in the gray box there. And so for general questions, uh, there's the Neurostars forum that was listed on the tutorial information. So you can go there and put any big questions, right? If you have some conceptual question that you want me to answer in detail, say at the end of the tutorial or at one of the major breaks, I'll go through those questions at each break and try to answer any big things. But if there's something major that you want, like putting up your hands during a talk, um, put that in the Zoom chat and that should ping me uh, and I'll be able to respond straight away. Um, so they're the two types of questions and the two ways that you can um, give them. The tutorial information is at this blank, black link here. Uh, that should all be visible through the shed. Um, there's Neurostars, I don't expect you to type that in, but that link is also on the um, schedule. And the tutorial that we'll actually go through um, is down there in orange and that's also listed on the um, information. So this is what I plan to do across the three hours today. Um, like I said, you can post up and down vote song break suggestions in the forum. If you really want one of the breaks to play, I'll play a certain song. I'll look it up on Spotify and play it for you during the break. <clears throat> And I'm going to have a break after each of these six um, sub areas. And so the first that I want to do, okay, someone may have put a chat in. How do I go to that? Yes. Okay, pal has got a song suggestion. All right, good. So we're all set for the next uh, break. Um, so the first, I'm going to do some background to time series analysis. Um, and how I developed this, what the philosophy is behind doing highly comparative time series analysis. This will be more just theory and a bit of history. Um, then I'll go through the major parts that I think are relevant to people using um, HCTSA as a piece of software that implements this approach. Um, and I'll show you how you can use this software to solve time series classification problems, time series regression problems, uh, find useful features for your problem and understand what those features do, wherever, um, 
whatever part of the time series analysis literature they're derived from. And then I'll show you how you can get low dimensional uh, feature based projections of your time series data set. Um, then we'll have a song break. Then I'll talk about how we can get reduced sets of features. So the, the classic time series analysis um, toolbox HCTSA that I developed has over 7,000 features. And then I'll show you how actually for many purposes you can get by with many fewer and how we've generated reduced feature sets for different purposes. Then after that introduction, I'll actually take you through how you use this software um, with an example of separating five different classes of EEG data. So I'll show you the, the software package in MATLAB, how you'd run it on a cluster, uh, and then how you'd use reduced feature sets like Catch-22. Then I'll mention that you don't actually have to use features for every problem and talk a bit about how different methodological approaches are more or less appropriate for answering different types of scientific questions. And then I'll talk finally about different ways of comparing data and analysis methods for time series. So that should take us through um, the three hours. Hopefully I finish a little bit early, probably around two hours, and then we have time for questions or you can have a break before the keynote um, coming up at the end of this tutorial. And you can come in and out uh, as you please, of course, being in a Zoom uh, meeting. All right, so the first one, maybe I won't play a, a song for this one, but at the end of this section, we can play a, one of Paolo's songs. Okay, so here's some background. What is highly comparative time series analysis? Right? Okay, so the first place to start is what, it's, what a time series is. And so a time series is a repeated measurement of some system taken over time. So often when the sampling rate's fixed, you have um, time zero, delta t, two delta t, etc., all the way up to n minus one delta t. Uh, I might, by default, turn other people's videos off. Um, and then you have the actual measurement that you've taken at those times, x1, x2, x3, x4, all, all the way through to your n measurements um, through to xn. So if the sampling rate's fixed, you can just represent the time series as a, an ordered vector as shown up the top, x1, x2, x3. Um, so it's just an ordered set of measurements where that ordering is typically taken from time. Strictly for a time series, that ordering is by time. And so these things are measured, of course, through all of the sciences, through industry, people that are under, interested in dynamics, how things change, the patterns of how they change. They wanna develop models of how they change. And they want to use those models to predict the future of some of these systems in, in many industrial cases, or they want to classify different types of time series. Um, they just want to understand the structure inside these time series. Um, so this is, these sorts of objects are studied all, all across science, all through industry, even in things like archaeology. You might put sensors on a production line to make sure um, your industrial process is going well. You might want to find credit card fraud. So you've got time series of different transactions and you want to find anomalous transactions. You might have your neural time series that you want to understand structure of, etc. So these objects are studied across science. Um, and so here are some examples of what they look like. We have some time series of carbon dioxide fluctuations, some simulations of dynamical systems, AR processes, sinus rhythms, rainfall, the audio of this guy brushing his teeth, etc. right? And just looking at these things, you can see you can get very different types of structure um, from different types of systems that you're measuring the dynamics of. Sometimes you have these slow fluctuations, sometimes you can see periodicities, sometimes you have kind of uneven periodicities, um, types of chaotic dynamics, some noisy peri periodic dynamics, etc. And so different people who are used to studying different types of time series might have different ideas of how you would analyze the data, what types of questions are interesting to ask about that data, etc. So it's a really diverse and interdisciplinary field of people that study dynamics of different types of systems. And so one of the main questions we ask is, 
how do I reduce these complex time varying patterns that are in the time series down to informative summary statistics? For example, if I have a time series like any of those ones shown on the left there, what different sorts of questions can I ask and quantitatively answer uh, in terms of the structure that are in those time series? So I might ask, what are the correlation properties as a function of the time lag? You can see the autocorrelation function there. What's the entropy of the time series? How predictable is it? Um, is there some hidden structure uh, underlying the time ordered measurements? Is there some nonlinear structure if I try and reproduce the attractor there? Is it stationary if I look at the dynamics of the first half and the second half? They have different um, conditional uh, probabilities. And so there are many different questions you can ask, and these different ways of quantifying structure in time series have been developed um, across all these different scientific areas that I showed before. Someone from biomedicine might ask different questions and quantify different structure from someone in you know, astrophysics. Both are looking at time series, but they'll ask different questions and have different standard methods um, to analyze their data. So here are some examples that you'd probably be familiar with some of these in terms of how you quantify um, the answer to some of these types of questions. How fast is my data varying? You can do a Fourier decomposition and look at different frequency bands, etc. How variable is it? What's the variance of my data? How predictable? You can do information theory on um, what the past states of the system have been and how predictable a given future state is going to be given that knowledge. Etc. So people have mapped these types of theoretical ideas in answering questions about dynamics um, to specific quantitative answers to those things. And that's been done across the sciences. And so the types of problems people tend to ask um, of time series data um, are very broad. You know, some people, like I mentioned before, are looking for anomalies in huge databases of time series that might be credit card fraud. They might be looking at huge star surveys from, say, one of the NASA missions, and they want to find anomalous time series. So this is kind of anomaly detection. A lot of people in economics will be interested in forecasting. So they want to fit a good model to past data and run that model forward into the future to make a prediction of what's going to happen to the system next. And if you do that accurately, you might be able to gain, say, the share market or something like this. Um, in other cases, like biomedicine, you're often interested in classification. So you're trying to find patterns in a time series that tells you, is this person about to have a seizure? Or you, know, you might be looking for a biomarker for schizophrenia, and you can measure something about someone's um, neural dynamics and then make a decision about um, what diagnosis to give them, what um, sort of treatment to give them even. So this is more a classification or regression problem. So just as time series, the study of time series is diverse, so are the questions people ask of them and the types of problems they try to solve. So in, in this case, I'll be focusing more on the time series classification style of problem. I won't touch time series modeling or forecasting uh, at all. So I've given you a kind of broad overview of what time series are, where they're studied, what types of questions and problems people um, ask of time series. So then you're left with the problem of, well, what types of features or what types of time series analysis methods should I use to solve my problem? Leo's joined with this video. I'll block him. Okay. Yeah, so you have all these different types of analysis methods that you could use for your data, right? You might go, oh, maybe I'm gonna look at something about the distribution of my data, right? Does it have a really, really long right skew distribution or um, does it have a really high, you know, kurtosis or something like this, something about the distribution that would be independent of the time ordering of your data. You might ask something about the stationarity of your data. Do the properties, um, does the model underlying your data have the same properties through time? And so on. You could ask properties, ask about the properties of 
self autocorrelation, self correlation. Um, you could decompose it to wavelets. You could look at the power spectrum, different structure in the power spectrum. You might use um, analyses from information theory, like information dynamics or different types of entropies to characterize your data. How complex is it? How predictable is it? Um, you might take a nonlinear dynamics approach and try and reconstruct the attractor and make inferences about is it nonlinear or linear? How nonlinear? How time reversible? All these types of things. <clears throat> or you might try and find structure in it from fitting a statistical model, like a, a linear model, like an armor model, um, exponential smoothing model, or a state space model. And there are all sorts of other types of ways that you can analyze structure in a time series. And all of these different types of statistical methods have been more or less popular in different parts of the time series analysis community. If you go into one discipline, they might be really keen on complexity measures. You go into a different discipline, they might all use linear modeling or um, wavelets in engineering, say. And so it's hard to tell um, for any given problem what the optimal type of method is. Please excuse my daughter um, screaming in the background. Um, she'll go to sleep soon, I hope. Um, and so this is, this is the main problem that HCTSA was designed um, to fix. Like we came to the time series analysis literature and we saw so many different approaches and lots of different papers that would only say pick one or two approaches and say how useful they were for characterizing the data. Then you'd read another paper and it just happened to pick a different one or two approaches, and then you'd read another paper, it picked a different one or two, and you could never really be sure that um, things were progressing. Or you always had that question in the back of your mind, what if they'd have used the other method? You know, would that have done better or worse or et cetera? So it was really hard to assess um, different um, scientific studies because they're all using different manually selected types of features. Um, to analyze their data. And so we had the idea to kind of try and assemble all these different approaches into one toolbox so that you could compare um, and perhaps even partially automate the selection of useful methods um, for a given problem. So you might say, I want to separate class A dynamics from class B dynamics, what method should I use? And in this case, it might compare across all these thousands of methods and point you in the right direction for your data. So this is kind of the philosophy behind highly comparative time series analysis and how it's implemented in HCTSA. You give it a problem, it compares across a wide literature of methods and kind of tells you the ones that, that work well. And this is one way that you can view um, how HCTSA can help your problem. And so when we first did this back in, well, it would have been back in 2009 that we did this, and it was published in 2013. Um, we showed the problem like this. So there are time series of many different types of structures. You can see on the left, we collected time series um, from share prices, time series from heart, um, from the heart ECGs. Um, we simulated time series from different dynamical systems and stochastic processes. Um, we looked at space recordings, etc., all the way down. And so every row of this matrix shown in C is one of those time series. You can see here in A that um, different time series have different feature vectors. So each time series is being characterized by a set of, in this case, over 8,000 different numbers that capture different types of properties of that time series. So these types of properties are shown in B, and we call them operations here. I've been calling them features elsewhere. It's the same thing. And each operation takes in a time series and outputs a number. So you can imagine an, a feature or an operation taking in a time series, outputting its mean, right? That would be one type of feature. Where it takes in the time series, outputs the power uh, in the lowest fifth of its frequencies. Right? That could be another feature. What takes in a time series looks at its 
you know, first wavelet coefficient. Um, that could be another feature. So it's just a way of mapping a time series object to one summary statistic um, that captures there. one summary statistic that captures the properties of that time series. Um, so when you put all that together and you make every time series a row in a matrix and every type of feature a column in the matrix and you put a color blue when that feature outputs a low value for that time series and you put a red when that feature outputs a high value for that time series, you can put the whole thousands of different operations that take in a time series and output a number can be structured according to their empirical behavior across a diverse set of time series. And then what we did is we reordered all the rows to try and put similar rows near each other using a hierarchical clustering algorithm. And we did the same with the columns. So we put um, features or operations on time series that have similar behavior close to each other. And, so, and we did that to the columns. And you can see that there's some rich structure emerging. You have groups of time series that might be from different disciplines, um, different types of systems that are nevertheless clustering together in that they have very similar properties as measured by these 8,000 different types of um, features, time series features. And similarly, when you look at the clustering of the columns, you see different types of features like a wavelet method and an entropy method or you know, a distributional moment method with a power spectral method. They're also often clustering together means that these apparently different methods actually have very similar empirical behavior. So kind of the philosophy of um, highly comparative time series analysis is that we can represent both data and our methods for analyzing data as objects. And those objects can be organized by their empirical behavior. So we can automatically organize our time series data by their properties. And we can also automatically organize our methods for time series analysis based on their behavior across data. And this gives us an easy way to bring structure to an interdisciplinary literature. So if someone brings me a new method, for example, I can see where it sits um, in terms of the library of existing methods and assess whether it's really a new method or it might just cluster with a method that's been developed already. And it also lets us compare across disciplinary boundaries um, to find groups of features that have similar behavior. And I'm getting some um, Spanish blue text coming up on my, on my Zoom. Oh, we have a question from Yoram. I'm not sure what this blue stuff is going to All right, Yoram. Table annotation. Have I got annotations on someone's writing? Allow participants to annotate. Security. Oh, here we go. All right, well, someone's annotating and I can't stop it apparently. I've turned off annotation on shared content. Anyway, so yeah, disable annotation. I think I have annotate on shared content, but maybe it's because it's already there. Um, anyway, Yoram has a question, private question, to say if there are two features with opposite values, they may be very related, but won't cluster together. Yeah, so we're, we're judging a um, feature according to its behavior across all time series. And it's true that they could be anti-correlated. So one gives red, like for example, this feature here is giving blue low values to these time series and high values to these time series. Whereas this column here is giving almost the opposite, right? It's giving high values to these time series at the top and low values to those at the bottom. 
So these guys are anti-correlated. Um, but the sign you put on out the front of a time series algorithm doesn't really change its behavior. Okay, Joshua is giving me some tips. Um, and so even if they anti-correlate, even if they're anti-correlated, we can still detect them as, and we would define them as very similar features. Okay, so Gregory's giving me some tips. Okay, I can open an annotation. Clear all drawings, done. All right, thanks everyone. Yeah. Yes, exactly. We can organize all our features according to their empirical behavior. Okay, good. So let's carry on. <clears throat> and so these are the types of questions that we can ask. Um, okay. Yeah, these are the types of questions we can ask once we have this information. Um, so we made this kind of diagram of the types of things you can do once you have a big library of scientific data, in this case, time series data, and you also have a big library of scientific uh, features that take in a time series and output a real number. And so I've shown up here uh, with green, um, a time series of type green, and it captures the properties of that time series as measured by these thousands of different time series analysis methods. So it's like a barcode for the structure of that time series. And inside that barcode is the structure of that data as measured by properties of its distribution, properties of its correlation, properties of its model fit, its complexity, different entropy measures, etc. We have a really broad thousands of different numbers that characterize different types of its properties. And what we're doing here in A is we're organizing the time series according to this very diverse, um, comprehensive set of measurements of time series properties. And so you can answer this question of, is there much structure in my time series data set? And you're not answering that question res with respect to manually selected features. You're answering that question with respect to a very broad interdisciplinary range of time series analysis methods. And the other thing I mentioned is that you can represent a single feature uh, as a column. And we are interested more in this type of thing. How do different scientific methods relate to one another? How can I compare a method developed in astrophysics to a method developed in heart rate analysis? Those disciplines don't speak to each other. But if I have this barcode for the behavior of their methods on real data, I can kind of organize a whole scientific literature with respect to its empirical behavior on real data. <clears throat> and you can do other things, cool things like matching time series, trying to find similar methods. If you come up with a new method, how does it relate to existing methods in terms of its behavior? And then there are questions on the right, E and F, um, to actually do answer specific scientific questions with specific data sets. And that's what I'll focus on here. Uh, so Rishika has asked a question about, so you can, if you're gonna ask a question, feel free to put it, if you can, in the everyone in meeting option, so everyone can see, um, but I'll, re I'll read this out. Here, Rishika has asked, these are all univariate time series. Oh, it's disabled. So everyone has to ask me. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. There we go. Okay, I've, I've enabled it. So Rishka has asked, these are all univariate time series. How would you deal with multivariate time series, such as population of neurons in the same region um, and compare across tasks? So it's true that all of HCTSA and all of what I'm gonna talk about today is about characterizing a single univariate time series. <clears throat> I can talk at the end about strategies for using this in multivariate settings. Uh, we're currently developing multivariate version of HCTSA. Um, uh, so once you have the multivariate version of HCTSA, you can compare both um, 
HCTSA, which is a comprehensive characterization of an individual time series, and also measures of how different time series relate across a complex system, such in an ensemble of um, neural populations. So maybe I'll leave it open like this. It's a bit ugly, but actually it lets me see the chat and everything um, in one go. How was that? Okay, no worries, Rish. We can talk about that more later if you like. Um, okay, let's leave it here. Okay, so what was I trying to say with this slide? I guess in pictures, this slide was talking about how different disciplines sometimes argue about which method to use for a given context. You know, someone in economics might go, oh, you should always use a Garch model for stationary, you know, innovation data and the person in biology will go oh you should always use fluctuation analysis because you'll always find something with the Hurst exponent or whatever and you kind of have these arguments about which methods better than which other method without really acknowledging the relationship between methods um, how they behave with respect to one another the data context is very important some methods will work well on some types of data and not on other types of data um, so you get this opinionated exchange sometimes in statistical literatures where people will have strong opinions on which methods are good, which methods are bad. It takes the subtlety out of um, the interdisciplinary relationships between the data and, and also the subtlety of what methods work well on what problems. So this kind of uh, philosophy of comparison can get you past a lot of those, past a lot of those issues. Right, and because we're at a break time, I will answer some questions. So let's leave five minutes for a break. I'll play Paola's song. For those who missed the start, you can put um, song requests in the chat or on the Neurostars, and I will try to um, play them in the breaks. So let's try and find Sveta's song, uh, Paola's song. Sveta's one, oh, here it is. Oh, right of the Valkyries. Oh, not the original, okay, good. By Clayton and Tom Salter, okay. All right, Paola's got a song request. This could be the first ever song request in a CNS tutorial. So we're forging new ground in the online format. <laughs> okay, Tom Salter. It's not a good time for my next break. Have an account. All right, maybe I'm pr prioritizing the music above of some people's questions. Apologize for that. Spotify is not playing. I think. Oh, here we go. All right, so I'll answer your question to the background of Paola's music request. So this is our first Trashy Club break to celebrate the Berlin time zone and the fact that I'm giving this lecture on a Saturday night. Okay. So it is orchestral. What are you doing? Oh, okay. suggested. <laughs> all right, maybe this wasn't a great idea. That's all right, okay, I'll try and answer Dimitri's question. Okay, even for univariate data, for each mission, okay, yeah, there are several parameters to tune. Yeah, so this was a big, maybe I'll answer this question in silence. <laughs> so, if, can everyone see Dimitri's question? So the question is, how did I build this feature set? <clears throat> say here, this is a, 
a text summary of over 7,000 features that are included in uh, HCTSA. And the question here is, for most of these methods, there are parameters you can tune. And so you could eventually blow this up if you tried every single combination. Uh, for example, a lot of these nonlinear methods, you can choose the embedding dimension, you can choose the um, time lag for the uh, embedding. And then once you've got the embedding, you have lots of parameters to find structure within the embedding space. Um, and so my philosophy was to try and choose common choices that were in the literature. For example, say the embedding dimension, people have methods to set that empirically, either as false nearest neighbors, for example, there are many other methods. Uh, and the time lag, people either set it often as the first zero crossing of the autocorrelation function or the first minimum of the mutual information, auto mutual information function. And so I tried to kind of come up with automated methods where I could to set appropriate um, to set appropriate parameters for these automated methods. Um, and in other cases, I just set what was common, even if they were hard-coded methods. Um, and that's, this is obviously no substitute for someone really thoughtfully applying a method to their data, right? Often the process of applying a very difficult, um, fitting a difficult model or applying a different nonlinear time series analysis method is an art. You have to play with your data. You have to visualize the data. You have to adjust the parameters with respect to some really subtle things. And this will never um, substitute that, but it can get close. Um, often you can try and mimic what that human expert would be doing. Like what properties are they looking for in these plots that help them set the parameters? And you can set your parameters um, automatically by trying to algorithmic, make algorithmic versions of what these experts would be doing. Um, so that's what I did, and, and you're right, but these are not 7,000 unique conceptual methods. In a simple case like linear autocorrelation, you know, I've just picked to go up to say a time lag of 20 or 40, something like that. And so you've got autocorrelation lag one, autocorrelation lag two, autocorrelation lag three. They're not conceptually different methods, but they are different features. And so there are not 7,000 unique concepts uh, in the library but there are 7,000 unique features. At one point we estimated there's about 900 different um, unique types of features. Okay, someone wants to play Sid Barrett. Okay, that can be for the next break. I'll finish uh, Paola's request. For those new to this, just having five different trashy club breaks to commemorate our parent city of Berlin. And to give you a chance to get some tea. I'll get I'll just get a cup. So Charlotte, I'll get your song ready. Wait, but my Spotify keeps crashing. Charles wants to see this. By the way, I'll be putting these slides up in shed or wherever I can after the talk. So these will all be public. Um,
in the play, I don't know what to say. Thank you, Paola, for the first song. Okay, so let me see Barrett, I assume it's this pink forward one. <laughs> Okay, we've got our next song ready for the next break. Um, did Charles want me to say anything here? Oh. <laughs> okay. well, people are saying they can't hear the music, so maybe this is a bad idea. Um, well, maybe I'll send you a link to the music and we can play it locally. Um, okay, that's all Charles wanted. Yeah, so this, this was, the point of this is just to show that there are many different ways. Ooh, Nina's asking questions. Okay, the point of this slide was just there are many different ways of quantifying different types of structure. And if you go into a different department in your university, whether the neuroscience, economics, biology, physics, medicine departments, they'll all be familiar with different subsets of um, a very comprehensive and, and diverse set of literatures on this topic. Okay, Amina's Robert, I will not be singing. People are messaging me privately, so anyway, Dimitri says you can't really hear the music in Europe on Ubuntu. <laughs> so maybe I abandon the music idea. If it if it sounded good through your speakers, let me know and I'll continue doing the the music idea. Um, okay, Amina says she's wondering, Amina, I guess, he or she, is wondering once you've found some order in the time series, what do you do with it? Great question. Amina's giving the perfect um, segue to the next section, which is what do you do with it? What is it? How do you use it? And so this is exactly what this next section will be about. And the payoff for listening through the next, this is a longer section, the payoff will, will be you'll get to listen to Charlotte's um, song choice from Pink Floyd. All right, so I've set the scene. We're all on the same page with time series, all the questions you can ask, all the different methods you can apply to your data. Now, what do we do with it? Um, so this is what, HCTSA is meant to address. That it allows you to compare across a really comprehensive library of time series features that we implemented and pick the types of features that suit your problem. So <clears throat> let me walk you through an example. So if we start on the left here, we have some type of system. I'm gonna walk through, a, in this case, a classification problem. And I'll remind you, this is the setting we're in, right? We've got a new piece of data and we want to classify it. Is it type A or is it type B? In this case, eyes open or seizure, but these could be any different class. That's our problem, right? We want to do well at this task. We want to classify new data well. And so here you can imagine different settings of this across different biological um, settings. So you might have uh, two genotypes being knocked out of Drosophila. You might have electrophys from um, different patient cohorts or speech recordings, etc. You've measured lots of time series from each type. So you've labeled a bunch of recordings as type A and a bunch of time series recordings as type B. And your goal is to find statistics of these time series data that help to separate types A and B. Um, and so the question is, how would you do that normally? If you start day one of your PhD, someone's like, we really want you to solve this problem, right? We've got all these time series of blue, another set that's labeled red. We want to find you a statistic that helps separate blue versus red. And you might look at it and go, oh, there's got some bursts going down there. Maybe I compute a new burst metric or, oh, these B ones, sometimes they're really noisy and low amplitude. Maybe I put some features as a noisy and low amplitude. It would be this type of kind of process of being creative, inspecting your data, 
trying to understand the types of features that might help uh, solve this problem using your intuition and your kind of data investigation skills. And so the alternative approach is that you just apply every possible method um, on your problem and pick those that perform well. So this is kind of the HCTSA approach. We've already implemented over 7,000 methods that take a time series and output some type of summary statistic. Fields wants me full screen. I will try and go full screen if this is annoying. The issue is I then can't see the chat, but. Um, right. So then you have all these. Then you have all these. Muting. Okay. Muted everyone and going full screen. Okay, so then we've applied all these 7,000 methods and now we can ask which of these methods do well? Right? Which ones help separate type A from type B? So instead of that bottom up process of you inspecting your data and manually selecting useful features, you just go, well, I'm going to apply methods from astrophysics, methods from dynamical systems, maths, methods from stats, methods from physics, biology. I'm just going to apply everything and it's going to tell me which ones worked well on my data. But this is really the highly comparative um, approach in action. And so rather than spending a couple of years of your PhD um, coming up with new statistics, you already start on day one, leveraging all of these different thousands of methods. Uh, and it can kind of point you in the right direction or even just say, we've solved, we've solved the problem, right? There's already a statistic out there that exactly solves your problem. Don't waste three years on it, do something else with your time. Or it might point you in a direction and go, look, all these entropy measures are working really well. They're not perfect, so you should spend your three years kind of tweaking them for your specific problem. Um, in both cases, it's just pointing you from all the different directions you could have gone and just showing you immediately um, which directions are useful ones to start, or at least the most promising candidates. And so in this way, it kind of overcomes the bias in in manual method selection, in that it compares every every type of method on an even footing. To get to Charles's question, to get to Francis's question. Okay, Francis's question I think is a major question that we might you could vote, um, post in the Neurostars. Um, so kind of the the strategy I went for is that bigger questions you can put in Neurostars uh, and urgent ones put in the Zoom chat if you want me to answer it straight away. Um, I'll check at each break the Neurostars and um, get onto the major questions that need a bit more time. Okay, and then once you have this time, okay, Rishika has a question. Hmm. Yeah, so Rishka says this is a very um, brute force and computationally expensive method, and this is true. Um, for a time series of length of 1,000, it can take a few minutes to compute all the features. Um, so if you've got a 1,000 time series, it might take a long time in raw computation, but of course it's massively parallel. Every feature computes on every time series independently, more or less. And so you can get uh, massive speed ups from a distributed setting. And you can also start with reduced features if computation is too much of a burden for your problem. I'll talk about that later as well. Okay, and then as you see on the right, you can then do statistical learning on this big matrix. So you see we've converted uh, a set of time series to a feature matrix. So now we have each row being an observation each column being a feature. And now we can do conventional statistical learning on this feature matrix. So this feature matrix is the bread and butter of um, modern machine learning algorithms, right? Like classification or regression. I can find individual features that do well. I can do feature selection. I can reduce the dimensionality and analyze the structure of low dimensional um, embeddings of my data set, etc. And so it's just 
in its simplest form, a way of representing a time series as a set of thousands of different properties of, the, of that time series as assessed by a really diverse library um, of time series analysis methods. So I'll take you through some examples of how we and others have used this representation of time series to do, um, to answer scientific questions. So the first thing is to say, what are we trying to do? And how do I get my data set in a form that is amenable to this type of analysis? So the main thing I need to do is construct a definition of what's a useful feature. In the classification example, this is relatively easy in that a good feature will separate my classes. For example, it gives high values to one class and low values to another in the simplest case. Um, and so you kind of need to find a problem in which there's an easy way to empirically define what a useful feature is and what a non-useful feature is. Because then you can compare all the features, assess them by this metric that you've decided is what you're looking for in the behavior of your feature, and then do the search for good features. <clears throat> and so I kind of alluded to this earlier, but we're kind of inverting the typical art of time series analysis, where you'll typically taught in your very first time series analysis course at uni, for example, or in a textbook, always look at your data, understand what you're doing, um, and we've taken this kind of brute force approach of we just trust the methods. And if we apply all the methods first, and on the, it, it lets us start with a ranking of the types of methods that are doing well. And then we have to go back and say, well, why is this method doing well on our task? Why is that method doing well on our task? But it's a useful place to start um, because it leverages thousands of methods that you wouldn't be able to normally compare and lets you um, work with their power straight away. And then it give, puts the burden back on you to understand why it's working and how it's working. Okay, so this type of analysis in terms of extracting the features, doing some basic types of um, learning on the resulting time series feature matrix is implemented in HCTSA. This is available uh, here. This is a MATLAB based code. Um, it requires a MATLAB license to run and compute. People can probably ask questions about that. Um, and it's got a lot of documentation on the Git books. Um, so you can see there's a link there in the about section. Um, and that links you through to this and it will take you through this. If you make it a PDF, there's over a hundred pages of documentation that takes you through um, setting up your analysis problem. It's got a few tutorials in there and then it takes you through every aspect of doing an analysis and how to use the software. And so I'm gonna try and cover the main bases uh, in this tutorial later, um, but there's always this comprehensive documentation and please give any feedback or typos on that. Okay, so here's an example, like I showed before. Uh, the last question I can answer at the break, I think. Um, you've got your time series data set. Uh, you compute your features, so now you have a time series by feature matrix. And now you can do stuff with that matrix. And so the rest of this section I'll talk about the stuff you can do with that matrix. And so you can see down in the bottom left, we had a data set of Parkinson's speech. And we had some subjects had Parkinson's disease, some were healthy controls. And now I'm trying to get the chat out of my full screen. And we wanted to understand which subjects um, had Parkinson's and which didn't, and we found new types of features to do that. Um, and you see there's a nice two-dimensional feature space in which we get pretty good separation. Uh, in the middle there, we've got some Swedish leaves. We did that back in 2014. Actually, if you do a low-dimensional um, embedding of the feature space, 
we get all these different Swedish leaves separating. And you might go, oh, Swedish leaves, not a time series. If you look in panel B there, you see all those patterns um, are the leaf shapes. And so what they do is they get the leaf and the time series is the distance from the center to the edge. And as they rotate 360 degrees, that distance changes, changes, changes. And you can piece together across the 360 degree rotation um, a shape profile for the leaf that appears as a time series-esque uh, object, where instead of time, it's like the angle of rotation. And so you can treat objects that aren't time series as time series when they're just ordered measurements uh, like that. And so we just measured the features of all those leaf shapes and projected them down into 2D. And even for these short little segments like that, we're getting uh, a meaningful separation of the different leaf types. In the bottom right there, we've used this approach to classify speech. This was actually a German, a German data set where they got different German actors to read the same passage in different um, emotions. And you can see we can separate a sad German actor from a happy German actor pretty well. But we can't tell if they're happy or angry or you can see that this is the confusion matrix of the different emotions. And in the top right there, this is actually going to be the data set I'll take you through the tutorial on. We have our five different classes of EEG time series. Uh, and we projected them down to a, a low dimensional feature space, as I mentioned before, for the Swedish leaves. And we see that a lot of those five different classes uh, occupy different parts of the space. Which means the feature space is giving a meaningful structuring uh, of our data set. Okay, so first I'll take you through the classification problem <coughs> and the feature discovery problem just through a few case studies of, that just kind of show you how we've applied this, what types of problems we've applied it on, and the types of messages that I think you can learn from um, some of our prior work doing this. Uh, so first I'll mention that it's not just us who've used it. In the past few years, there have been some um, other groups that have started to use the software. You can see there's people in the top have used it to separate different types of energy use in buildings. Can I tell from the energy smart meter time series if someone's vacuuming or running a microwave, for example? You can see in the top right, people are trying to distinguish these MEPs, motor evoked potentials from multiple sclerosis. Uh, down the bottom, they're separating different hand gestures from um, accelerometer data. What features of the accelerometer data predict the different hand gesture movements? Uh, and in the bottom and bottom left, they've measured neuronal activity and they want to assess um, the two different stress conditions. Can I separate the conditions from um, features of the time series? Hi, Sasha. Hi, hi. I might get you to turn your video. Oh, I might stop the video for now. Okay. Okay. So, here's the first case study I'll take you through. So, the big methodological and philosophical point I want to make is that without comparison, how can you tell if one of your methods is close to optimal for what you're doing. So you see again and again in the literature, people will say, I'm trying to separate this type of signal from this type of signal. Here's one method we've tried. It works pretty well, you know, end of paper. And then if you look through a literature, you'll see tens, sometimes hundreds of such papers that are all manually selecting a method, talking about how well it does, sometimes making quite um, strong claims about how well it does. But without comparison, how do you know if that manually selected method was a good one? Sometimes I'll develop new methods and talk about, look how amazing our new method is when they don't compare it to what already exists. And so you always finish reading such a paper and go, 
are they really making progress, right? Was the method that they developed really new or does it reproduce something that already exists? Is 97% good? It sounds good, but maybe it's an easy problem where something much simpler could get 100%, etc. You never really know um, if you don't perform a wide comparison. And sometimes these methods sound very complex and get good performance. And you always wonder, was that complexity necessary? Is it really impressive, etc. And so one thing that HCTSA lets you do is compare across thousands of other alternative methods easily. And you can kind of at least start to address these types of uh, methodological concerns. And so an example I'll give you here is um, this 2010 paper that last time I checked had over 600. It might have many more now. And that's much more citations than any of my papers have had. Maybe the most I've had is... I don't know, maybe 200 or so. So these people are at least three times better scientists uh, than me. And yet, they're making the same problem, that, the same mistake that um, I'm talking about here. So what they did was they tried to separate time series um, in a seizure from time series um, from EEG that weren't in a seizure. And this is the same data set we'll analyze later. And they said, we made discrete wavelet transforms. We got features of them. We did an ICA. Then we used radial basis function kernel SVN, and we got an accuracy of X. So they combined wavelet features. They had some of the Upanov exponents. They had all these quite complicated features, passed it through these nonlinear methods, and then ended up with this high accuracy. And they make this claim that it's likely methods of this type will be useful for, etc. right? They make a big claim because they're getting high 90 accuracy. But when we compared um, the features, you see there in panel C that the standard deviation of the data is getting 100% uh, accuracy. So this is, a, and when you look at the features that worked well in their approach, um, the features that were at the top of the list were those that were sensitive to the variance in the data. So I want to, on a quick reading of this paper, you might go, wow, 98%, um, amazing, right? Well, we must all start using Lyapunov exponents and wavelet transforms. Um, but then when you look at the comparison, actually, this is a very easy problem that's solved completely by standard deviation. Okay. Time evolution of features. So someone else has a question there that I would consider um, a question for the break. So I'll carry on with my talk. Okay, so this is, this is a big thing I want to flag. Right? You really need to compare um, your approach to alternatives if you want to make claims about um, your approach being better than others, which is typically what you want to do when you're progressing a literature. You want to make claims that you're developing something that is progressing and making things better and not reproducing um, what was already easy with complexity. In this case, putting Lyapunov exponents and wavelets where they don't need to be used because standard deviation is already solving this problem. So this probably happens in your field. You can probably think of examples where papers will come up with a new method or use an existing method and not compare enough to justify the claims they want to make. Um, and you can compute a distribution of accuracy or error here shown in B and see, well, where would my method sit on that distribution? So if I compute the distribution from HCTSA, which features are really good at this, which features are really bad at this task, uh, and I put my method in that distribution, is it going to sit near the top? Is it going to sit a bit further down, but it has other benefits? Maybe it's faster. Uh, maybe it works well on a particular type of time series or gives better intuition. doesn't have to just perform best, but at least having that comparison uh, is a place that you can start from. And I think you always want to know that information. How well does it do relative to others? And HCTSA is a way to compare on a scale that you wouldn't be able to do manually um, and with an interdisciplinary breadth um, that would otherwise be unfeasible. 
And I think that this is such a big deal affecting methodological literatures that really peer reviewers and editors should enforce basic levels of comparison. Uh, if you were to see a paper like this, you'd go, well, have you compared it to alternative methods? Have you at least made a basic uh, comparison before claiming um, that your really complex method is going to change the world? All right. Okay. And here's another example um, where when we applied our methods to heart rate variability, distinguishing people with congestive heart failure with, from those with normal sinus rhythm on the basis of their RR interval time series. Um, we pulled out the best performing features and then we organized them by their behavior. So that's shown in A here. Uh, each one of these rows and columns is a different time series analysis feature and we've grouped them by their behavior uh, in terms of how correlated they are to each other. And you can see there are different families of methods that are all performing well and similarly to each other. And this kind of lets us empirically organize the literature um, by its performance. And that when we went through all these different families, we saw, oh yeah, someone's written a paper on that one. Oh, someone's written a paper on that one. And so all the way through here, there were different papers with each paper picking one or two of these methods. Um, but when you do HCTSA, you can pull them all out at once, structure them, and you have a kind of overview of, of which methods are doing well and how those methods relate to each other. And so I kind of make the point there that instead of writing 10 papers on the topic, you can just write one. Uh, maybe that sounds worse. It depends what your department values, but I would argue it's better um, for science if you can see all the methods that do well in one go rather than manually picking and spending years comparing them all uh, one by one. Uh, actually using more time than I thought. But I'll make this point here that um, instead of, it might sound like, oh, what's this brute for 7,000 different features? How are you actually going to pull that down to something interpretable that's going to help me understand my dynamics? I mean, each feature in principle is interpretable because it's based on an algorithm that's being used somewhere in science. Um, often it's hard to interpret, but it's coming from a, a place in an, an existing theoretical literature. So when you actually dig down and find the handful of features that do well on your problem, you can then start to interpret them, understand the relevant literature, and therefore understand your data. For example, you might find, oh, entropy is doing really well on my data. What type of entropy? Oh, sample entropy is doing the best. I'm going to go and read sample entropy papers, and then I can interpret that our oh, patients are doing, have higher sample entropy than healthy controls, or, you know, astrocytes dynamic have more um, temporal entropy than neurons, etc. All right, Amin has got a question. Okay, she's answering someone else's question. I'll get to that in the break. How do you determine a well-performing feature? Yeah, so this is really the, the crux of it. In this case, we just wanted to separate seizure from non-seizure. In this case, we wanted to separate normal sinus rhythm from congestive heart failure. So features that do well at separating those, like these guys shown B, C, D, E, you can see they're giving different distributions for the two subtypes. And uh, we say they're good performing features. And there are many ways that you could um, quantify that. <coughs> you can imagine a, a T, stat, T statistic, you could fit a linear classifier and measure the accuracy of the classifier, uh, etc. But it all starts with you defining what is good for your problem. And on that basis, you can then compare thousands of features on that statistic that you've said you want to optimize. Okay, so in this case, we showed that actually, when you just have two features, you're, um, you're beating the performance of a, a standard method, which was 12%. Now we're down to 4%. And actually, it puts your data set in a two-dimensional space that's interpretable. 
In this case, first it's separating a fe the first feature measured the trend direction. You can see these have positive trends, these guys have negative trends, these guys are flat. And then the second feature compensates for the first feature mixing up orange and uh, green by then measuring low frequency power and separating off the, the noisy sinusoids from the noise. And so you can see instead of a black box method that might perform well but you don't understand, all of a sudden you've got your data separated in a nice 2D space and you understand what both of those dimensions are doing and why it's grouping your data uh, in the way that it is. And of course, you also have dramatic dimensionality reduction. These time series might be thousands of points long, and now you've condensed them down to just two numbers, the first feature and the second feature, rather than measuring the value at time one, value at time two, all the way up to the value at time a thousand. So as well as dramatic dimensionality reduction, you get interpretability uh, and a nice structuring of your data. And of course, in these cases down the bottom, just a single feature is separating the classes almost perfectly. All right. Okay, I think we get the point of all these different applications. Um, we've used it to try and predict the P blood pH um, of fetuses at delivery towards more objective ways of intervening during labor. I'll talk a bit about this neuroscience one where we, <coughs> this is work done with uh, Maria, Valerio Zerbi, um, Nicole Wenderoth in uh, ETH um, in Switzerland. And in this case, they had different um, they were measuring the fMRI uh, bulb dynamics of different cortical areas and they'd actually injected uh, a viral uh, agent through dreads and that um, affects the firing of particular types of neurons. Uh, so in some cases it's affecting the pyramidal neurons, sometimes it's affecting the PV cree neurons. Um, and there was another SST case which is not shown here. And the question was from that change in the microstructure, uh, the micro circuit, um, can we find features of the bold time series that can distinguish the different conditions? And so this was one of the problems that we applied HCTSA to. We wanted to say what is different about the dynamics when I change the excitation inhibition balance through these um, um, viral uh, injection causal manipulations. And we could both get useful ways to classify the different types of conditions. So if I pump up the EI ratio or pump it down, um, what's going to change in the bold? How well can I classify different bold signals? And what about those signals uh, is changing? That's uh, the questions in the break. None of those are exactly about misconceptions. So I will check the Neurostars every break as well if you have questions uh, more broadly. And the other thing we did here was we trained the features of the bold signal that we knew distinguished different types of um, manipulations on the cellular level. And we then applied that classifier to new data uh, in this case, um, gene knockout mice to see if it could also distinguish the knockouts first controls. And you could imagine if you took this further, you could have a little way of diagnosing from fMRI what's happening uh, down in the cellular level if you extracted the appropriate time series statistics um, from your bold signal that correlate with um, different microstructural properties. Okay, it's meant to be a tutorial and maybe I put too many examples in, but I'll kind of give you a really overview flavor of, it's really just to show that we've applied this methodology to many different problems in neuroscience and outside of neuroscience. I mean, in this case, 
we wanted to see which properties of the ball dynamics in mouse correlated to which properties of their structural network, their local structural network. So we gave each um, brain area a measure according to its structural connectome and each um, brain area, uh, all the features of its bold dynamics. And then we, we asked, well, what different time series features map on um, to which types of network features? And you might think, oh, you've got so many features, you'll find a correlation. But the, the effects were so strong that we could properly um, bump for any correct and still find meaningful relationships. And areas with high in degree um, tend, turned out to be the most correlated to um, different time series features. In this case, there were properties of the time scales um, of fluctuation. And you can see even if we don't have the directionality, so because the mouse uh, connectome has direction uh, and weight, we could compare directed, weighted, uh, directed, undirected, weighted, unweighted versions of the connector. And we still, we found that weight was very important, but direction wasn't so important. And so we ended up still finding really strong correlations in the undirected case, which made us think maybe we can do it in human. And we replicated the results uh, in human. I won't talk about that much. Okay, we've also applied it to um, gene knockouts. So if you're doing high throughput phenotyping, you might go, well, which gene knockouts are affecting which properties of my dynamics? It could be neural dynamics. In this case, it was movement dynamics of either a worm stuck in a little arena or a fly stuck in a tube, and you're measuring properties of its dynamics. And we wanted to say, well, which genes that you might knock out affect which properties of the worm's movement? And does male and female have different movements in the day or night? And which features are good proxies for those differences? And so this data we, is all available. You can download the HCTSA results for it. And I've got code in these two repositories that you can work through all these and reproduce all these analyses for yourself. Uh, so this is a good complement to after the um, tutorial material that I'll take you through today. You may want to go and um, test it also on these data sets. Okay, so the, the variable that we're trying to predict will not always be a categorical label. When it is a categorical, categorical label, this is a classification problem. We want time series properties that are informative of our label. But sometimes that um, the thing we're trying to predict is a real number. And so then we have a regression problem. Uh, we wanna find time series properties that predict the variation in that um, real number. And so we've also done this um, to find the distance to the critical transition in simulated systems, self-affine processes, and things like predicting the pH um, of a baby from its um, fetal heart rate time series during labor. So that's just a, a slide to show that you can also use these features, not just for classification, but also just throw this feature matrix into a regression, machine learning regression algorithm and do the same in that case. Okay, this is a long section, but I'll finish off by showing how useful low dimensional projections can be. So if you have your time series data set on the left, we convert it to a feature space. So each time series is a point, in this case, in an over 7,000 dimensional feature space. What if we reduce the dimension of that uh, high dimensional feature space to an informative low dimensional representation that tries to capture the variation in the full space? And will leveraging methods from across the time series analysis literature help us find informative types of structure that are relevant in an unsupervised way uh, for a given time series data set that I might have measured. And so people have done this. Uh, on the left, that was with a hand pick set of about 20 features, I think, and they were interested in uh, which time series uh, models do well in predicting time series with different properties. So I really like that work. 
in that it acknowledges that different types of methods do well on different types of data. And it tried to say, well, what types of data are best suited to what types of methods? And it projected time series down into a feature space in order to address that question. And stuff we've done are the Swedish leaves I showed you before. You can see that picture of what I was trying to show badly um, using my hands, that they're rotating that leaf and forming a time series from the distances to the center. I showed you that flies in a tube example. And here's the epileptic EEG data that I'll take you through in the tutorial today. So in each of these cases, we've projected time series into a high dimensional feature space and then done a PCA of the feature space. And you can see that different types of data are sitting in different parts of that feature space. Here's another example where we put really diverse data um, and then we reduce the dimensionality and you can see we've got um, ECGs sitting in different parts from heart rate intervals, share prices, music. So if you zoom in on that bit labelled B, well, we've got sound effects, animal sounds, music and you can see on the edge there that they've all got that kind of audio-esque type of features. And so that makes sense that they're all sitting in the same part. And you can see there's an orange guy there. That's a simulated piece of data that has the same types of properties from a dynamical system. Um, so it's really interesting when you get bits of data clustering with real um, model generated data clustering with real data, because it suggests that this might be a good model for the types of patterns in your system. And it can suggest generative mechanisms underlying specific pieces of data and it's the same in um, if you zoom in on a there at the top right you'll see there are three different time series in that cluster and you have some share prices and pendulum dynamics and, and stochastic equation etc oh so here are more examples that low dimensional feature space projections can give meaningful um, projections of a complex data set. You can see at the top there all these different classification tasks. The classes are pretty well separated in the low dimensional feature space and we've been working with some astrophysicists um, to help classify and label the data um, that they're measuring from some of these NASA probes and we can distinguish the different types of stars um, from their light curve time series. Okay, I'm definitely gonna skip this, but this is to say that we've, we're starting to verify that these low dimensional projections really do map onto meaningful parametric variation in the underlying model. And we've verified this by generating data from different low dimensional systems. And when we generate data from a one dimensional system, for example, just a single parameter can vary, we tend to get this one dimensional dynamics shown in the top right. And then as we move down to the bimodal switching in the top, uh, in the right middle, we see we get an approximately two dimensional variation. Oh boy. Okay, and then when we get to the bottom right, when we vary three parameters simultaneously, we get this kind of three dimensional variation. So by looking at the dimensionality of the feature space and the types of variation that it explains, we can start to understand the parametric freedoms in the model underlying the data set. And this is exactly what you want to do in many applications in real world data. Oh, and this is what I wanted to show there. When we applied this low dimensional uh, anal feature space analysis to fly data, we extracted um, two key dimensions that explain most of the variation in the data. And when we looked at what they were, the first one was kind of telling us um, how much activity there was in general. And females tend to have more activity than males. And so it's separated meaningfully along that first dimension. Then when we looked at the second dimension, it was kind of a, an index of circadian rhythmicity. So we were pulling out the two major variables um, automatically from this feature space analysis that told us that actually all this complexity underlying your data can mostly be reconstructed with just these two underlying parameters. Uh, and that was possible through this 
um, highly comparative feature um, projection. <coughs> and some recent work that just came out uh, last week um, was when they did this uh, in the brain. So they looked at the bold dynamics across all brain areas, um, reduced it down to two principal components, and found that those principal components in brain dynamics, um, brain, di brain dynamical properties map onto other properties of um, the brain anatomy, such as the gene expression principal component, um, the functional hierarchy or cortical thickness, etc. So time series properties um, tend to vary with um, underlying microstructural properties across the brain. And of course, once you pull out a low dimensional component, you can say, well, what types of features map onto that or load most strongly onto it? And you can then interpret them. And in this case, we found that just basic autocorrelation and the kurtosis of the distribution were following pretty strongly the variation in these two main um, low dimensional components. So you can see you can start with a really unbiased set of thousands of different types of features and by telling it what you're interested in, in a supervised case, or in this case, the unsupervised case, just saying, please reconstruct uh, as much of the dynamics as you can, or as much as the variation in the feature space as you can. Um, you can start to whittle it down to just uh, a few core dimensions that are relevant to your problem, and then you can start to interpret them and understand what's happening. All right, we made it. Is this gonna go, oh, okay. Okay, so we made it to our next break, which means I'm going to go through the chat and play. So first, I'm going to play the, the song suggestion. May kill your... So if you want to play that on your end, you can do it. I'll go and fill up my water and I'll come back and answer your questions. All right, who enjoyed, <laughs> who enjoyed that? Yeah. 
No one. Okay. I'm not sure if that works well on your. the speakers there. But I had a dream to play music breaks. So why not let me dream? Um, okay, so we're halfway. I'm going to go through some of the major questions um, that have been posted on the Neurostars, or at least the relevant ones for now. So Sanjay asks if it's okay to take screenshots. Yes. Please, this is all open. I'm recording it. I may even post it on uh, CNS, ask me if I could share it for their YouTube or whatever. Um, all of this is open, if it's not too embarrassing um, as I get tighter and tighter. Um, so yeah, you're welcome to take as much of this as you like. I'll make the slides available uh, afterwards, uh, directly after this talk. I think. And you can put screenshots wherever you want on the conference album, uh, social media, etc. Okay, Sanjay also had a question on. Yeah, I thought I would get this question. Yeah, so there is a reliance on MATLAB in this toolbox, um, which just came from the fact that when I started coding this, and I started in 2008, so this was. Um, I started coding this 12 years ago. Uh, check out my maths, right? Plus 12. Um, and at that point, I really couldn't code at all. And I just started with whatever's easiest, which was standard in the physics department I was in to use MATLAB. And it had lots of open toolboxes, etc. cetera. Um, if MATLAB is a barrier for your application, you're in an institute that doesn't have a MATLAB license, for example, um, or you just have an ideological preference for open source software, there is alternatives. So the other feature sets, um, and I'll post a link to that in response to the question. If I click reply, You? Sanjay, yes, I can. Okay, there's some information there uh, on the HCTSA wiki um, for different Python versions. You can call it from Python, but that doesn't get around needing the HCTSA licenses, uh, the MATLAB licenses, sorry. Um, okay. But yeah, we have, I'll talk in the next section about reduced sets that you can run from Python, R, Julia, et cetera. You can't run the full 7,000. And like you said, there are many external toolboxes um, that really are MATLAB dependent, but we're starting to make open versions with Google Summer of Code students, et cetera. I'll talk about that in the next section. Okay, Poe says, Okay, post question is quite specific. I might answer that uh, later. Yeah, I'll answer um, F Skinner's question as well. Yeah, and Roxana's question, yes, we can. Yep, and Roxana, yeah, I'll give slides and video to the tutorial afterwards. Um, and some of the questions are quite specific to one or another um, specific problem. And I don't think it's worth delaying uh, the tutorial for those, but I'll get to all the questions and answer this, even the specific ones um, by text, probably <laughs> um, on Monday. I don't think I'll be staying up through to the early hours of the morning. Um, you can wait, hopefully you can wait. Uh, were there any other big ones in the, this chat? Someone wanted to ask about time evolution of features. Yes, we haven't done that specific um, thing, but you can imagine windowing your time series and computing a small set of features in each window. Um, you can do that. It's probably more feasible 
with a smaller set of features, which is what I'll talk about next. Okay, Amina talked a bit about that. I answered Charles's question. Yeah, Chaitri's question is a bit more subtle. If you don't have a labeled data set, you can do the sorts of things I mentioned in the second half of that section where you're just doing unsupervised problems. But it's not going to magically work out what your question is and answer the question. Typically, you need to tell it what the question is and define what a good answer to that question is. Um, for example, you want it to label two types of time series and a good feature labels them accurately. Right? That would be an example of once you give that uh, to HCTSA, you can do the rest. Yeah, and you can go to town if you don't want to use a simple classifier. Once you have that time series by feature matrix, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and this also gets to the question asked by Sanjay, that you may do your computation in MATLAB, but then you can export it, you know, with your feature matrix and your labels as a CSV file and do all the rest of your analysis in R or Julia or whatever. So you're just kind of outsourcing the feature computation to MATLAB and then doing all the rest of your analysis elsewhere. That's all fine. Uh, Amina, Professor Stroop. I don't have to mention this in the break. Okay, then I won't. How do you avoid, oh, Charles wants to know, how do you avoid user bias towards some subset of the methods? Yeah, that's a bit of a subtle one. I think if you want to um, go further on that, Charles, maybe I suggest you put that in the Neurostars. I'm not quite sure what you're getting at there. Yeah, Dimitri asks, is this robust to artifacts or outliers or do you have to remove them first? I mean, it's not a magic, it's not a piece of magic, right? It'll only be as good as what you put in. If you put in noisy data that's badly labeled or full of outliers, a lot of the time series features are just gonna be sensitive to the outliers and you'll get bad results. Right? <clears throat> so it's not this magic thing that automates everything. You have to think very carefully about what question you're asking, what data you put in, to compute the features on and how you structure um, what a good answer to that question is. Um, and if you put in noisy data with artifacts, most of the time series analysis methods are just gonna be sensitive to those artifacts and give you a bad result. So you can try it, but I suspect you'll get much better results and find much more informative features if you throw in data of a high quality. But you could answer the question, right? How well can I do, you know, with noisy data? Throw all your noisy data in and you'll get an answer, right? Maybe you can separate your classes with 60% accuracy. So it could be chance, but uh, maybe after doing your noise removal, it's getting 80% or something like that. Mm. Yeah, Gabrielle's question says you could do a sliding window approach and compute features in each sliding window. And then you have lots of feature time series, right? So you have the value of the feature in each window, and then each feature then has a time series of its variation across windows. And then you could do meta extraction and get features of the extracted features. So for example, what's the entropy of the windowed standard deviation or whatever? Uh, yes, you can do it. Yeah, but you can't escape the, the massive comparison problem. And in general, that is something you really have to think carefully about. Um, if you're going to compare 7,000 things or even suggest ways that you could combinatorial, combinatorially um, get many combinations of features, you really need a strong signal to separate noise, um, to separate signal from noise. Um, so there are many 
ways that you could structure it. You may want to start with uh, a far reduced number of features and try and go hard on them. You may do a, a leave subset out where you first pre-train on promising features and then out of sample test those. Um, there are many strategies you could try, but yeah, it would be unfeasible to, to do HCTSA on every windowed feature time series. Yeah, Rishka has found my Python HCTSA. There was a, well, I'll talk about that maybe. Um, converting all of HCTSA to another language is a huge task because it relies a lot on many of the MATLAB toolboxes. And when I go to some rooms, they want me to code it into Python. I'll go to a next seminar and they want me to code it into Julia. And then I'll go to the stats department and I'll say, why isn't this in R? Or if I, if I spent the next 10 years coding it into everyone's favorite language, I wouldn't have much uh, science to do. Um, okay, but yeah, we have made some headway in coding reduced feature sets that are the most promising and I'll show that in the next section, into C, and then you can call C from R, Julia, Python, etc. Okay, I've answered Nima's question earlier, so I might just crack on. We're getting to the final section. Uh, I wish you can see that. I need to share again. Okay. You see this, yes. All right, let's go through. And I'll try and leave at least an hour for the actual tutorial. Like this is a lot longer of a build up than I wanted, but I really wanted you to understand the foundation of, of the tool and some examples of where it's been used. Um, so some of you have been asking again, the types of questions that lead into this next section. Um, why are there so many features, right? 7,000. It takes a long time to compute. It relies on having a MATLAB license, which limits the accessibility, etc. So there's some, some downsides in running the full HCTSA library on your problem. And so this is something that we tackled uh, in this work published last year, where we wanted to first put every feature through a pre-filtering, where we asked which features are uh, performing better than chance. And we evaluated this across 93 different time series classification tasks taken from across the literature, focusing mainly on data mining type tasks. This was a public um, time series um, classification task um, database. And so we found that, okay, most of them are doing better than a random number generator. That's very good more than 90%, but we got rid of those that weren't on these problems. And you could ask, are those problems bad or they just didn't find their niche on these 93 simple tasks? Uh, that's another question. We then filtered those that performed the best across all the tasks. And then we tried to reduce the redundancy of those top performing features um, down. So we got a kind of minimally redundant um, accurately performing set of features. And so we started with 7,000. We then went down to 5,000 something. Um, and when we took our top features and clustered them down to remove redundant features, we ended up with a set of 22 most promising features. And you can see that the accuracy with reduced feature subsets there in blue um, starts to saturate around 20. And so we can reproduce the performance of full HCTSA with over 7,000 features on these 93 tasks to within 10% uh, of the full accuracy with just 20 features. And those 20 features um, compute in um, per 10,000 samples, um, 20 seconds. It is actually much faster than that in the final implementation. And so you can see up there, we took these 22 features that are a good representative of the whole library. 
um, coded them into C and made them available as Catch-22. And because there were 22 features, which we didn't artificially man uh, manifest, it just so happened we got 22. Um, and so we called it Catch-22. And they span the types of families of features that are in the whole feature set of HCTSA. So you've got measures of the time series distribution, you've got measures of self-affine scaling, measured through fluctuation analysis, you've got different measures of the temporal statistics in terms of the correlation properties and entropy, you've got the linear order correlation function and some nonlinear versions as well. And these will run in milliseconds. You can see in the top there, yeah, up in the top, um, across all the features, um yeah sometimes they even perform better but normally they're less than 10 percent worse than the full set and they run so much um, faster 10 seconds for 10,000 samples in matlab and if you use a c implementation 10,000 samples they're running in um, less than a tenth of a second or around a tenth of a second and they scale very fast you've got to get up to um, time series of 100,000 long before they'll take a second to compute. And so this has the benefit of being a good approximation of the time series analysis literature in a really concise set that computes quickly. Um, I will note that we removed um, features that were sensitive to the mean or standard deviation of the data because we were interested in properties that were picking up interesting temporal patterns that weren't just trivially picking up changes in the mean or median or variance. And so just be aware of that. If actually you're interested in classifying your data with Catch-22, um, you should add those back in if they're useful to you. For example, it may perform really badly relative to another classifier that just puts the mean in, right? Because the mean may be highly informative of the classes you're interested in. But there you go, that gets to some of your questions about can I do this type of analysis outside of MATLAB? You can't do it with the full set, but you can do it with this canonical um, 22 feature set. There it is, I linked to it uh, in HCTSA and also in the tutorial material. Um, and so when I made that question before about if you're peer reviewing a paper that doesn't, that makes big claims about a new method being better than others, or about this performance being really great on a really difficult problem, but doesn't actually compare to alternative methods, you could say, well, why don't you just run it against at least catch 22, right? They can't say it takes too long. They can't say they don't have the MATLAB license. You can run it in seconds. And it provides a simple baseline of how simple types of time series features can perform on your data set. Because they run in milliseconds per time series, you can do it very quickly. And I'll again focus, uh, emphasize that you need mean and variance uh, features. So you may want to make it catch 24, adding in the mean and the variance if, if that's relevant to your problem. Um, and we've recently, like in the past month or so, been taking it even further. So Catch-22 was trained on generic time series classification tasks across a broad literature. Who's to say that those 22 are also relevant for specific problems in neuroscience? Um, so we've been, we've had a really talented student, uh, Imran, who's been working with us through the Google Summer of Code and he's been taking sleep EEG data and reducing it down to around 20 features that perform similarly in classifying sleep stage information to the full HCTSA. Um, we've got another set that do really well for mouse fMRI. And so you can start um, for a given class of data or for a given problem, you can start by running the full HCTSA to get the breadth. And then you distill it down to the small subset of features that work well on your problem. And then you can code those features into C and then they're available for the whole uh, community, whether they use um, Python, Julia, whatever. So 
So this has been our strategy um, to train out different reduced subsets and try to uh, make those available for the broader community. All right, we made it. I feel like I'm out of breath. Now I talk maybe faster when I'm on my own in a room at 10 p.m. Okay, so, so no one's put in a song choice. And some people were saying those songs weren't helping them much anyway. <laughs> Local thing. What about that voice? Here? Spotify. Maybe my Spotify not working is trying to tell me. No one wants to hear Fat Boy Slim. They're trying to learn about time series. Where is it? So while I get set up for No one wants to hear that voice through me. <laughs> you can listen to that on your own time. All right, so next I will be taking you through. I'll even be brave and put my whole screen on share. I will be taking you through um, an example of how to um, run these types of um, HCTSA analyses on your own data. Okay, there we go. Okay, so you're not interested in Fat Boy Slim. You are interested in. This is the tutorial website that I linked through uh, on the shed site. This this thing. So on the shed site, you can see. The tutorial website here <coughs> and the discussion questions in the Neurostars thread which people have been um, asking through here and the tutorial material okay you have to go to the tutorial website first and then here is the tutorial um, link that will take you here um, and my strategy is to work through uh, this tutorial um, from top to bottom. And hopefully we get this done soon within say half an hour. And then I have time for questions or to give you guys a break before uh, the keynote. Okay, so feel free to put any questions up in the chat. Uh, it's been really good having you able to answer having you able to ask questions as we've gone. So I've, I've mentioned this data set before. Um, this is the one where we have five classes of data. Where is it? This guy up here. Distinguishing EEG and seizure. So we have five classes of data. Um, eyes open, eyes closed, um, preictal in two different areas, and then during a seizure. Set E. And so this is a nice data set in that we have a hundred examples of each class and they're easily labeled into five classes. So each time series is I think a thousand samples long and we have a hundred examples of each. So our task is going to be to separate the classes as well as we can and to find the types of features that do well at separating. Um, different types of classes. So I've tried to be comprehensive in this tutorial in that even if you're not here, you could follow this exactly, right? I take you through the steps, 
You can download the input file for the data. You can download the results of the computation. So if you don't have anything installed, you can do everything. No, I don't know if the EEG are bids compliant. This is an old data set from 2001. Okay, and then so I've, I've even taken you through the whole um, analysis through to screenshots of what I got when I ran different functions. So you can t go through this in your own time um, or even um, afterwards. Okay, or people that missed this tutorial can try to make it as well documented as possible. So I'm going to try and have it half and half. Or I'm going to take you through the steps here and basically read through what I've written uh, on this part and also implement it as I go. So message me if you like. If you're game, you can play along at home. And I'll have the documentation here. So the time series documentation uh, is here. And it tells you all about much more than what's in this simple tutorial. Okay, so the first step in an HCTSA computation is setting up your data set. So you need to tell it what are your data? Are you going to assign any keywords to your data? And what are you going to call each data, each piece of data? And each piece of data is a time series. So here's an example of an input file. And this is the thing that you start with, that you tell HCTSA everything about what you're trying to do. So if we load this, you can see we have time series data. Okay, so actually each time series is 4,097 long. So if I look at time series data, the first one, this is just a list, an ordered list of numbers, and that's my time series. If I plot it, there we go. This is the speed you get with proprietary software like MATLAB. See how quickly that plot came out? All right, I'm joking. Okay, so this defines the time series data set. Um, um, in this case, it's a cell. Okay, you can see it's a cell with five, 500 entries, and these are one for each time series, and each element of that cell has this vector which describes the data. Um, I've also labeled the data. Um, so the labels just tell me uh, a name that I'm assigning to each piece of data. In this case, I've called it exactly the name of the data file that I loaded it from. You can call it anything that identifies it for you. And there's also keywords um, that tells me the label that I want. And so sometimes you might want multiple labels, like you might have um, a patient ID and a time of day and a you know, different categories of patients. You can put them all in the keywords, comma delimited, and it will, HCTSA will be able to relabel your data according to any um, subset of keywords, as I'll show later. In this case, we just have a single keyword for each time series. It's either eyes open, this works. Yeah, it's either eyes open, exactly what I put uh, up here. Eyes open, eyes closed, epileptogenic, hippocampus, and seizure. So this is how you structure a time series data set. So it's up to you to kind of generate these three objects and put them in an input file. Once you have that, um, you can generate the starting point for your HCTSA analysis using the TS init um, function. So what tsinit does is it takes the information about your data and then it adds information about the features you want to compute from your data and generates a big um, 
all the matrices and tables that define the results of applying all the features to all of the pieces of data in your data set. So which features does it use? Um, see in the documentation that the input files for features are of this format. So there's an input operations file. So this says every feature is a line on this file. And in the same way, it's given a code string, a name, and a set of keywords. And so this file here defines every feature that I'm going to compute on my data set. And this is actually the HCTSA library. And you can see we have seven, over 7,000 lines in this file. Some Fourier spectrum features, some nonlinear time series analysis features. As we get through the 6,000s, we're getting pre-processing features, some wavelet features, some nonlinear embedding features, state space modeling, Garch modeling, um, surrogate testing. So that defines every feature and you can use any input file you like, right? This is the default for HCTSA. You could make your own set with your own features. You could have some of HCTSA features, add a few lines for your own features. You can make this uh, as flexibly as you like. But by default, it will use um, this feature set. And then the master operations, this input file, maps the names you've given to your features to the code that you need to run to produce it. And this is handy for some functions where the code outputs 100 different numbers. And so you only want to run that code once and then take the 100 outputs as the separate features rather than running that code 100 times, taking one feature each time. So this defines all the pieces of code to run um, that you can then take all the features out from um, when you get your individual features. So in this case, it needs to run 1,068 um, pieces of code. And that's just what's shown there. So in the case that you're running catch 22, there's only 22 uh, features. And this will run in milliseconds rather than um, minutes. So you can define your own input files, but by default, um, if I just run TS init, will initialize, it will just use the default HCTSA input ops and input mops files. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, I've actually already done it here. So maybe I need to move this out. So let's see what that looks like. If I do a TS in it, proprietary software. All right. So this should say here's all the information about my data set because I'm not putting any extra inputs into this function, it should initialize with the default um, functions from HCTSA. So first it says we've got 500 time series, yes. We've loaded the data. Does this look okay? These are the first five. Yes, that looks okay. Type Y. <clears throat> and then it will go through, just to show you, you can turn off this, but by default, it shows you each one of your time series with a little delay. And it's good practice for you to actually check that the data look right and that it's loaded everything properly. Um, and so these are all the hippocampus data. You can think in your own head, what features would I be pulling out to distinguish these different types? So even amongst the epileptogenic data, they're all quite very, the seizure are the most distinctive. Look at these guys. Anyway, so it loads all these, we're almost there. There's 500. And it says all 500 pass quality. So they just check that there are no missing data, no NANs or infinities or anything like that. Um, constructs the tables for all the features. And there we go. So it's initialized a new file with the 500 time series a thousand masters, so they're the ones that need to run pieces of code and 7,702 
See, I said more than 7,700. I've just made it. Every time I reduce the features, I get close to that threshold. Um, okay, so now we have this hctsa.map matrix. And now we're initialized, right? This matrix, uh, this .mat file contains all the variables that um, define my hctsa analysis. So we've got, now git info is an important one. This says at what hash was I? Because sometimes the features will change over time and you do not want to be running an HCT analysis, HCTSA analysis on an old set of features with a new version of the code that might give inconsistent results. So it's worth storing that and making sure um, you're evaluating features consistently with the ones you initialized your data set with. For example, if you initialized on your local computer, did the computation on a cluster that had a different version of HCTSA, um, you might get into problems. <coughs> so it keeps the hash there for you to do that check. Um, and let's see what it's done to the time series table. So it's basically just constructed a version of the data that as we told it in the input file, if we look at the operations, also tells us about all the operations. So in our matrices that store the results of the computation, you see we have 500 by 7,000, 500 time series by 7,000 features. And this will store the results of applying every feature from the operations table to every time series from the time series table. I might turn off your video, Isa. Um, okay, so this, is now all empty, right? None of these values have been computed. And so the next step once you've initialized is to actually fill in all these empty values by running each feature on each time series. And then you'll fill in this 500 by 7,000 dimensional uh, matrix. And so that's done with TS compute. Um, and TS compute, okay, I've shown you a cool way. TS Compute, you can tell it if you want to run it parallelized, so it'll run across the cores of your computer. Um, and you can specify a custom subset to compute. So here I've suggested, let's just run it by computing the first time series and the first 50 features as a test. So let's run it. So it loads in the data, and I've told it just compute for time series one and features one through 50. a long time. Well, anyway, it computed those 50 features uh, and stored them back in to HCTSA. They say I now want to run features 51 through 60. It'll load the data. There's the features 51 through 60, saves them back, and then that's done. So in practice, you would do this across a cluster, um, or you do it on your laptop overnight or something like this. And so this is code that I've produced for running it on a cluster. So you can take your time series, and that's just how I computed um, for the computed data. In this case, I took this HCTSA matrix, I used the code in this repository, on the cluster and what it lets you do um, depending on whether you're using um, slurm or pbs it has this shell script that will take from so i would set a minimum time series id one through to 500 so i'd say i want to compute time series one all the way through to 500 all of them and i want say 10 time series per job and it will split off into 50 jobs, each containing 10 time series, um, compute them all, and then at the end, you can agglomerate them back uh, into your main matrix. So that's a way to do this whole computation on a cluster. 
uh, easily using the MATLAB formulation. I might also mention that you can also run huge calculations with a, it'll link up to a MySQL database. And no matter what core on what computer is running, it will store the result um, back to a central MySQL database. So that you can run massive databases um, and distribute it across um, computers running across the world, all writing to the same database. I mentioned before that you can run the same um, result with catch 22. Um, and you might actually, maybe you can play with this. See how we go with catch 22. So you can see here, what if I do it? So here, catch 22, I initialize. Now I have an HCTSA matrix for catch 22. And instead of 7,000 features, I now have 22 features. And if I now do TS compute, you can see they run very quickly, right? It's computing 22 features for each time series. And because this is compiled in C, those 22 features run faster than you can see them. I could even turn off this show to screen option. Um, but it's probably <laughs> going to get through them quite quickly. So you can see you can run your whole time series data set um, through catch 22 and do all the computation very quickly. And it's just a nice way to get started because you can circumvent all that supercomputing or um, depending on the size of your data set. You can just get started with a 22 dimensional matrix rather than a 7,000 one. And yes, you'll be missing out on some of the power of the full set, but you can get started really quickly. Okay, this is still running somehow. Done, there you go, 500 time series computed. Um, each time series over 4,000 samples. And we've got our full 500 by 22 matrix done. Maybe I'll leave that for later. We may want to play with that. Okay, but I have the pre-computed one sitting in prepared earlier, and you have it here. You can download from Cloud Store in this link. You can also download the input file here uh, on Cloud Store. So you can reproduce what I've just done. You could try computing for yourself, or you could just uh, cheat and download the pre-computed ones. Uh, there. And so I mentioned this as a really important step that sometimes you don't want every type of feature contributing to your classification. Um, for example, trivial differences in the mean between your time series often aren't interesting to you as a scientist, right? If class A has a higher mean than class B, and that's the only thing driving the classification of A versus B, it's quite a trivial thing. Um, that I probably didn't need to spend hours on a cluster to find out that the mean differs between my classes and I can get good classification accuracy just from looking at the time series mean. So often you want to filter out time series that match a given keyword. And I'll show you how to do that here. In this case, you can find the IDs of time series features that are location dependent with this keyword block depth. I've annotated all the time series features that are. Um, and you can then take a subset of the feature matrix that filter out those uh, features. So often I've seen applications of time series, HCTSA in the literature that don't do that. And when I look at what's driving the results, often the mean is having a big impact. And so it's a bit deceptive to say, you know, 7,000 features are classifying the data when a lot of that classification is driven by um, quite trivial features. And I'll show you later how to check that um, systematically. But I thought I'd mention that from the start. Okay, and so once you've done your computation, so you see what we've done, we've initialized our data set, we set up our keywords, our data, we computed all the features on all the time series. Um, the first thing we wanna do is say, um, inspect quality. So how well did the features do? Which features had problems, etc. So the first thing this does is spits out every feature that 
didn't give a good real value on at least one time series. And so it will say, look, this feature had 0.2%. It gave a special value. It could be a NAN, it could be an infinity, uh, it could be an error. And then the worst offenders are up the top, right? 100% special values. And these are things like trying to fit a chi-squared distribution. The data are not positive only, so this will always fail. Uh, it's not that it's coded poorly, it's just that this is not appropriate for the data. And so the, none of these EEG data are positive only, so you can't fit, same with a Rayleigh distribution or a gamma distribution. So a lot of these make sense and that they'll only work for certain types of data. Um, others may be specific to your type of data. They may be too short to run some of these algorithms properly. And so for some of the data, they give bad values. And you can see here which features, it says here 494 had at least one special value. And you can zoom in and say, oh, what's this feature here that, um, you know, feature ID 615, had you know the last two and a bit percent were NANs, or you can go and inspect this um, um, for any specific feature you want. So that's a good starting point just to check that your calculation went well and to understand which features um, had some bad values on your data set. In this case, we're going to lose 400 or so if we filter out all the features that had any bad values, and that's okay. We can deal with that. We'll still have um, more than 6,000. And so the next step is doing this filtering and normalizing. So <clears throat> we've got our 7,000 features. Um, we want to filter out the bad performing features. And sometimes we may have a tolerance to keep some bad performing features. Sometimes we can't deal with any bad performing features. And you can choose your thresholds for filtering. By default, it keeps time series that are 70% good, and it will only keep time series that are 100% good. So even one bad value, it will filter out that time series. You can change those thresholds as you like. It also normalizes features with this um, sigmoid normalization that tries to get them all on a similar scale and in the unit interval. And you can turn that to whatever you like as well. Um, things like classifiers tend to like all the features on a similar value. So you don't want one feature that's measuring the length and goes up to 5,000, and another feature that's measuring the p-value and only goes up to, to one. Uh, you want the features to have similar relative scales. So if we run this TS normalize, it says it's using a sigmoid removing time series with less than 30% special valued outputs. Okay, it did it. And so we end up with a, okay, we still have more than 7,000 left. And now we're in TS, uh, HCTSAN. So it's kept our original matrix um, MATLAB file HCTSA, and it's created a new one with this uh, underscore N to be the normalized filtered version. You can see our full version has over 7,700, and after filtering and normalizing, we're down to 7,034. So we can always go back to our original and refilter or normalize differently. Um, that data hasn't been overwritten. Uh, the filtered and normalized is in this new HCTSA underscore N uh, MATLAB file. And so now we can access the normalized form with this norm shorthand. So all the HCTSA functions, you tell it what file you want to analyze, and norm tells it that by default it will look at this HCTSA underscore n file. And so next we want to set up our class labels. Um, if I just do it with label groups, it will say, I've looked at your keywords and it seems like you have five classes. Is this true? I'll say yes. And it'll say here are 100 matches for this class, 100 matches for that class. And so what it's done is in the time series table, it's just put a group label at the end. 
And so in this case, it's trivial because every time series has a keyword, but say we only want to label two of the classes, right? And turn it into a two class problem. And we can specify those two classes in our labeling. And it's saying, oh, we've got a hundred matches for each. Um, here we go. And so now it's labeled. Eyes open, seizure, and all the others have no label. So the labeling tells um, the data, the labeling tells the other algorithms um, what to classify. So in this case, I think, and you can clear a given labeling with this clear function. In this case, I think we want to label our five classes, eyes open, eyes closed, epileptogenic hippocampus and seizure. So we'll tell it that's the labeling we want to, we want to look at. And when we're doing our, class, our classification, um, that's what we're interested in. Okay, so now that we've labeled our data, when we use a function like plot time series, and we tell it to look in the TS, uh, HCTSA underscore N matrix for the normalized filtered data, we will get um, five groups and they're, they're plotting 50 time series, um, 10 from each class. And this just shows you what some of the data look like uh, in one big uh, plot like that. And the results of this will depend on how you've labeled your data. Okay, so that's a very first check. Now we can actually look at what does the matrix look like? So that's TS plot data matrix. And I'll say, it, look in the TS, the normalized data and plot um, the data matrix. So here we can see our 7,000 features. I think it's 7,002 or 7,034. And it tells us the output of each feature on each time series. You can see it's not so beautiful because it's all jumbled, but we can zoom in and move around. Um, and there's even a little annotation so we can find the, the name of our time series. We can see a little annotation of its time series and we can see all 7,000 features um, as we move around and zoom up and down. If you want it to look nicer, you can run TS cluster and it will reorder the rows and columns of the matrix to show the visual structure. And maybe I don't do that now because that takes about a minute, but you can see what you would get if you did TS cluster and then reran um, the plot matrix. And now you can see with after reordering rows and columns, you can start to see the structure of which types of features are performing similarly. And you can see here a big anti-correlated cluster. This group of features is anti-correlated to this group. Now, the next thing you might want to do is look at the data set in a low dimensional space. Um, so let's do a PCA um, projection of the low dimensional space. It'll tell us the feature loadings on PC1, the feature loadings on PC2. In this case, it's a bunch of lempulsive complexities approximate entropies in the first case. Get rid of Alexandra's video. Uh, and here it's got our six, our five classes in our two dimensional space. And you can see those classes are pretty well separated, even in this unsupervised um, representation. And it's picked a few to um, plot an annotation for. You can actually get it to allow you to click on individual time series and it will plot annotations for the ones you click on. But here I've just got it to automatically plot six random time series and you get the marginal distributions of the edges. <coughs> so that's how you do a low dimensional plot of this matrix. So I'm just taking you through all the basic functions from plotting your data as time series, plotting the results of your feature matrix, clustered or unclustered, plotting a low dimensional representation. This is what you'd get if you did a T-SNE. And it will also give you accuracies um, 
of a classifier operating in that space. And this we can see in the PCA projection, uh, a linear SVM can classify the five classes with 76% accuracy, uh, and the TSNE projection is better, 87%. And here is an example of if I relabel, and I say I'm just interested in eyes open seizure, I can relabel with TS label groups according to these different two, two class problem. And just to show you, then when I plot the low dimensional projection, um, it'll only show those two classes. So it's as if we only had 200 time series in our matrix. Um, now it's just doing the classification, the SVM classification. Uh, and it plots the boundary in this case. Uh, we have 100% accuracy. This is that, um, exactly the problem that I showed earlier, where that 600 citation paper um, was claiming a lot from there, um, the Apanov exponent version. Okay, so. Now, when we go to actually classifying the different feature, uh, the different classes, I might actually go back and relabel them the five groups. No one's asking questions. I assume it's very clear. I feel like I am rushing a bit, but I do want to try and get this done before um, before the keynote and give you a bit of a break before then. Okay, so now I've got the five classes set up. <coughs> you can actually set all the um, classification options in this give me default classification parameters. Sorry, Wenjun, I'm gonna have to turn off the video. And so this tells it what classifier to use, uh, what loss function to use. If there are imbalanced classes, it'll automatically do a balanced version of accuracy. Um, to reflect the fact that um, you need to adjust your total classification accuracy in class imbalanced situations. You can set how many folds you want to do for cross validation, etc. And if you want to repeat the cross validation with lots of different folds to remove the stochasticity of any particular uh, partition of your data into 10 folds, you can set uh, repeats uh, there. Oh, no, that's up here, number of repeats, yeah. Okay, so that you can set, and if once you change the parameters here and you run this classification parameters structure into all the other functions, they'll respect all the settings you've put in here. So it's just one place that you can set all the options about your classification. So if we let it run with the default parameters um, for the normalized data, it will load it in, it will say, okay, I've got these five classes, and you wanted me to classify them with all uh, the time series features. So it's trying to train and evaluate this five class SVM classifier with tenfold cross validation. And here it'll spit out the total accuracy, 92.4% um, of a tenfold SVM linear with 7,000 features, 7,034. And we can see where it makes the mistakes. Uh, in the cross validation. So in this case, you know, sometimes I mix up eyes open, eyes closed. I, uh, I predicted eyes open, but it was actually eyes closed seven times, right? One before 1.4%. Um, you can see the big, the biggest errors are in separating the two preictal uh, periods. Um, seizure was actually very easy to classify. Uh, Etc. So you can analyze where it made the mistakes. You can get your accuracy uh, value from the full feature set. Okay, and we got the same as I show here. You can um, determine the significance of your results by repeating um, with lots of shuffled versions of your data set. So I show an example here. I won't run this again, but you can label the two hardest to classify um, classes, the two pre uh, pre classes in the two different areas. And you can specify a number of nulls 
uh, in the classification. And when you run TS classify, it will run 20 times the same classification procedure, but shuffling your labels. So shuffling the assignment of these two labels to your um, data. And then it will piece together a null distribution of what you'd expect to get in your accuracy uh, under shuffled labels. And this allows you to assess the significance. If you did a large number of nulls, you could get a p-value of your labeling versus random labels um, to assess whether the accuracy of your labeling is um, better than chance. And here, because we have 100 examples of both, the null is quite um, narrow. But if you have small numbers of time series in each class, this null can stretch out um, and really affect the significance. Um, another thing you can do is test different types of feature sets. So, I don't know why I put five repeats here, but here's an example of me wanting to do more repeats of the cross validation uh, to piece together at lower, um, lower variance results. Okay, and so it's evaluating um, the same classification with different subsets. So it's saying, what if I use the catch 22 features instead of all features? And you can see here, it drops the accuracy about 10%. But these compute very quickly. This takes a long time. Um, and those kind of major errors that I mentioned before about what if you lose location dependent features or spread dependent features, length dependent features. And you can see location dependent features are doing better than chance uh, here. Uh, spread dependent features, etc. So you can just compare. And in this case, it's nice that we're preserving around our 92% accuracy, even when we remove location, length, or spread dependent features. Um, so this would be a real problem is if we removed our mean and median and all these types of location dependent features, if our accuracy dropped dramatically, um, this would be a problem because it would signify that, well, it wouldn't be a problem, but it would signify that the mean is driving our accuracy um, to a large extent. And therefore, we can't claim that um, we're picking up interesting dynamical features. It's just a trivial property of the distribution of the data. And so this is what comes out um, with 7,000 features, tenfold, five repeats, I'm getting 92%. When I drop to the catch 22, uh, catch 22, I get 80. When I remove location dependent, I'm actually doing a bit better. This would be within variance. Uh, etc. So that's that one. Um, I can also say, well, what happens if I look in low dimensional spaces, right? One PC, two PC, three PCs versus the full feature space, 7,000 dimensional space. So we get 93% accuracy in the full space, but with just two principal components, I can already approximate that. So maybe you you all you need is 80% and you just want a simple classifier. You don't want to compute 7,000 numbers. You just want to compute three numbers and you can deal with the trade-off inaccuracy of however many percent. In this case, the PCs are linear combinations of all features, but you could make it sparse uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, okay. What if you want to know the specific features that are driving the classification? And so I'll show you, this is a key function, TS top features. And so this kind of lists out what are the features that um, are separating the classes best. Uh, in this case, I've told it to assess how good an individual feature is based on its classification performance. So it fits just an individual feature, it will fit a five class uh, linear classifier with boundaries distinguishing each pair of classes and then it goes through all 7,000 and it will list out the best performers. So in this case a wavelet measure did the best, getting 60% accurate. This multi-scale entropy, um, control entropy in this case, it took incremental differences, gets 58%. Detrended fluctuation analysis is doing well. This is like almost the greatest hits of physical. A lot of these are coming from the physical 
time series analysis. Here's one from the medical literature from heart rate variability. So you can see in the top features, it's really got a broad range of different types of ways of analyzing the data. A simple measure from the medical, some wavelets, some fluctuation analysis, this really simple one. This is from a economics literature actually, so is this. A Lyapunov exponent, simple autocorrelation is actually doing all right, 55%. So then up to you to understand how are all these features working. And a way to help you do that is plotting uh, this pairwise dependency, which features are performing similarly to others. So here we've got the top 40 features by their performance and then clustered by how similar they are to other features in the top 40. So here we see this big list and you might go, oh, look at this state space model it's doing really well. And it's like, no, it's 0.99 correlated to autocorrelation at lag three. <clears throat> so this is really essential for interpreting the top features so that you don't overinterpret what looks like a really complicated feature where that complicated feature is really just picking up a very simple property of the data, like a low order autocorrelation. And so in this case, you could throw away all these more complicated ones and going, they're reproducing exactly the behavior of the lag three autocorrelation. And you can see another couple of clusters out here. These are actually relatively unique, probably only 0.5 correlated to the others. These are all the detrended fluctuation analysis measures on DFA. So there's one cluster there of detrended fluctuation analysis. This big cluster here, which is related to uh, low lag autocorrelation. And then you have some measures of the distribution here from the medical literature. Actually, the sample entropy measure is highly correlated to the simple medical measure. So you probably don't need that, the complexity of the entropy measure here. And the Lyapunov exponent is actually doing something relatively unique, which is interesting. Um, okay. Someone's joining for the last 20 minutes. And then it shows you these distributions for individual features so you can interpret what they're doing. So here, like what was one of our interesting ones? Autocorrelation lag six here. You can see it's giving high values to hippocampus class and low values for eyes closed. Um, so it's really good at separating these two pre ones from eyes closed. Um, there's some overlap in the others. And so you can really um, understand individual time series, individual time series features and how they're um, distributed across the classes. And this is just a, a summary of all the features um, here. You can see the best features are getting up at 50, what is it, 59% accuracy uh, on their own. And this is a five class problem, right? So 20% is chance. And so a lot of the features are beating chance. Um, and some of them are really good. Yeah, and uh, Xenia's uh, described one of the big challenges, which is really interpreting these top feature lists. Um, so I give you, I'll probably just leave it. There is a few extra things here, but that's the main functionality. You can do the classification. Just to recap, you can get your data in, you can visualize it, you can project it to a low dimensional space using TSNE or PCA. You can do classification in those low dimensional space. You can do classification with the full set of features and get the matrix. You can do permutation testing to get a p-value associated with the significance of that classification. And you can test that that classification performance is not being driven by any specific feature subsets. And also see how well it reproduces in low dimensional feature spaces. And then the big thing you want to do is then interpret individual top features, like which specific features are helping me uh, in my problem. And that's with this TS top features function. And it will show you how they cluster, what they do. And you can, if you look in the 
documentation for this. I've only, all these functions, I've only given default options, but there are many more inputs that you can customize um, to get uh, more information. For example, you could look at the top 100 rather than the top 20 or, or something like this. Um, okay, so that's the basic stuff. And then, uh, well, there's more stuff. If you've only got pairs of features, you can do a t-test and look at the null distribution um, versus your features. If there's a specific feature you're interested in, maybe I'll show you this. Um, okay, well here actually, autocorrelation lag three was one of our ones, right? 95. And so if I look at the distribution, this will just gives me a, a zoomed in version and it will show me for, so this is the distribution of autocorrelation lag three across my data set here on the left. And it slices through this distribution. It's plotted a time series in the data set corresponding to that value. And you see at the top there, uh, it's picked mostly of these purple ones. Um, but the label here tells me what class it's from, eyes closed, eyes open, et cetera, seizure. So it just lets you see how it's ordering. And you can visually see clearly here that the ones at the top have a much lower, auto, a much um, higher autocorrelation at lag three than the ones at the bottom. Um, so it, sometimes it just helps to visually see how a given feature is, is behaving. Um, okay, Xenia's question is the most important in that it's difficult because it'll spit this out. <clears throat> and for me, who spent three years in a dark room, um, depressed uh, during his PhD, coding all these things. So all these names mean something to me, but for you as a new user, how do you understand the features? And so I've written actually a page in the documentation on this. Um, interpreting features. So here I'll say, often this is a very cryptic list. How do you make sense of it? And the first thing you can do is look at the keywords. So it'll tell you, okay, I don't know what all this means, but this is a wavelet uh, measure, or this is an entropy measure, right? This does scaling. So the keywords gives you a very quick uh, measure. Here I can say it's spread dependent, right? So it varies with the variance of my data. Um, and you can then inspect the code and look further into um, the code of, what, of what's happening. And the final tip I give is to just plot this and sometimes you can visually see how that function is, is performing. But yeah, there's no easy answer. You can either email me or just try and get in depth here, autocorrelation lag three, you can tell is very simple. Um, and here's another cluster. You just might need to spend some time going through each cluster and understanding what types of features are there. Um, so yeah, that's the hardest part. Um, HCTSA will throw all these features at you and you have to then, um, like I was talking to you before about it inverts the time series analysis process rather than you starting from the data and coming up with new methods to analyze it, it throws all the most relevant methods at you at once. And then you have to try and digest that list and understand how those different methods are working. Um, Pal has asked, how much does HCTSA rely on the keywords in the input data set? So the keywords are only used if you wanna label your data. Um, if you never label your data, you don't need the keywords. But in this case, all this functionality of being able to label groups easily uh, is only possible relative to the keywords. So if I didn't set keywords, I couldn't have done this labeling. So it's important for you to, um, just to make it easy for you to label the groups to set the types of keywords that are relevant um, to what you're doing. Um, so you can use this inbuilt um, group labeling function. Okay, so that went longer than I thought, but I got through it. I'm gonna skip the final bits of uh, the presentation. All I wanted to tell you was that there are other bits 
There are other ways of representing data than features. There you can look at features of subsets of the data. You can use shapelets. You can have dictionary representations. Features is just one way and it answers one type of question. Um, it's not always relevant for every problem. And I'll leave this philosophical final bit. But we're developing a way that you can drag your own feature on to a web platform and find similar features automatically. And we've also already developed, um, this came out just a few weeks ago, um, a web portal for anyone to share their data. And when you drag your data on to our web um, server, it will compute the features of your data, find the nearest matches. For example, I threw on this Sigur Ross song uh, and it found um, similar types of data to my um, Sigur Ross data. So Compension is this big open library of time series data that you can uh, use for many different applications. So I would have liked to have talked more about that, but maybe I spent too long playing um, club music. <laughs> Charlotte might. Um, okay, so here are some references if you're interested in this work. Um, this was uh, kind of the brainchild of one of my supervisors during my PhD, Nick Jones, uh, and some other students have worked on it since. And we now have um, some Google Summer of Code students working and some others at Sydney working on this. Um, so the, here are some references um, of papers you might like to read. Here's the GitHub um, for everything related to the tutorial. The data to reproduce all the tutorial material and all the code you can see here, and all the outputs is all there um, on this GitHub. And there's the documentation I mentioned. I think everything's online. So thanks for bearing with me. This was a bit of a nervous experience, um, especially when I can't see anyone uh, and I'm sitting here on my own. Uh, with my daughter crying, everything. But I hope you found it useful. Um, and I hope you enjoy doing HCTSA. Don't hesitate to get in touch. I really, given how long it spent me, it took me to develop all this. Um, I really like to see people using it and enjoying or doing useful science with it. So I'm always happy to answer um, emails or anything like that if you have for me. Um, oh, thanks everyone for being so kind. Um, if there's questions, I guess there's only five minutes left, so I'll probably just answer all the, the final questions on the Neurostars. And don't be shy. If you have a question that you think might be out of scope or you're just curious, just post it here. And within the next few days, I'll go through and make sure I answer everyone's uh, questions, uh, even if it's specific to your application or uh, just a general question about um, the platform. See, here's one that's very specific that I'll try and answer. Um, so thank you, everyone. I really appreciate you sticking with me through um, this. I hope it wasn't too weird. Um, and I welcome any feedback. Otherwise, please enjoy CNS. Uh, thanks for keeping me company on my Saturday night. Uh, and I wish you all the best in your um, science. All right. Thanks, everyone.